can get going. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, my name is Kim Portmas, and I manage the Science, Technology, and Policy Fellowship Program with the IAI, the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. Thank you for joining us today for our panel discussion titled Perspectives of Emerging Leaders, a dialogue with an inter-American coalition of early career fellows working in the science policy interface. Just a few housekeeping details before we get started. As I mentioned, um, we have simultaneous interpretation available for those that need it. Thank you very much for interpreters for being with us today. You can post your chat in the chat at any time, any questions or comments that you may have. And we're always curious to know where our audience is joining us from. So if you can include, include in the chat or in your name, where you are from or where you're currently located, that would be great as we are a diverse um, team ourselves, we're always curious to know who we're talking to. A brief overview of our agenda this morning, this afternoon, I will provide a quick context as to the actions that we are trying to take in the science policy interface. And then we will hear from four of our science, technology, and policy step fellows participating in various organizations from across the Americas and how their work is, is related and impacting sustainability issues of a variety of disciplines and a variety of angles for solutions. Following their presentations, we will have a discussion with the audience around these key questions and we hope it will be an enriching discussion so that we can um, share and hear from you, the audience, your own experiences in the science policy interface. So this whole week, we have heard incredible testimonies from a variety of stakeholders and experts on their experience to address sustainability challenges. And a reoccurring theme that I've heard is around the implementation of the solutions that have been identified. Um, this is obviously not easy, nor one size fits all, but the importance of these kinds of conferences like SRI is that we can draw inspiration and make the connections with people and organizations so that we can learn and work together to continue to do this very hard work. The transdisciplinary learning approach was discussed yesterday in one of the sessions, and I really appreciated the concept they discussed about conducting more humble science practicing receptivity and being flexible enough to adjust to the rapid changes around us. The urgency of the time and we live along with the solutions that we will be sharing on this panel require that we build a more proactive um, strategy to strengthen the science policy interface in government, which means we need to invest in building human capacity but also expanding the boundaries of our institutions. Our panelists today are part of this special space, the science policy interface, seen here in this wonderful collage created by a scientist, artist, and fellow, Anne Teresa Birthright. Um, they are also part of a transdisciplinary learning space where we are trying to cultivate effective skills from diverse cultural contexts strengthen international networks and support action in emerging science policy ecosystems across the Americas. The II launched the STEP Fellowship Program in 2020 during the pandemic as an innovative program in Latin America and the Caribbean seeking to place local early career researchers or fellows in public or private host organizations to research, inform, and provide advice to science to local governments and national governments or decision makers on global environmental change and national sustainable development issues. The host organizations, some of which you can see listed here, gain capacity to then interpret and uptake science to support policy and decision making. Fellows from Latin America and the Caribbean form part of this inter-American network through program partnerships with the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship in the US and the MITAX Canada Science Policy Fellowship Program. 
Since 2020, the IAI STEP program has more than doubled, working with 45 fellows in 11 countries. As many global environmental change issues are transboundary, the IAI STEP program emphasizes science diplomacy and regional collaboration through a professional development program that complements each fellow's local work plan or project. Today, we will hear from four of our Inter-American Fellows on how they are mobilizing their scientific expertise from very diverse fields, as you see, towards the common goal of increasing sustainability in the Americas. Today, we start in Argentina via Berlin <laughs> uh, with Dr. Sofia Nani. So I will stop sharing my screen now and hand it over to Sofia. Sure, thanks. Kim, I will share my screen. Let me know if it works. And just in case, because my connection is not the best now, I, I might um, turn my camera off if that's okay. No worries. I'll let you know. Okay. Um, let's see. Are you, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay. And now you see the full screen, right? It's coming. Not yet. Yes, now we can. Okay, thanks. So I will start first by introducing myself. I am Sofia Nani. I am a doctor in biological sciences, and I'm from Argentina. Uh, and now through a postdoc position with a host institution that is CREA, uh, an organization of farmers, and CONICET, which is a national Research Council in Argentina. I'm working uh, on uh, biodiversity conservation in subtropical dry forests of Argentina, particularly the Argentine dry Chaco. And I named this presentation um, from biodiversity conservation to human wildlife coexistence in agroecosystems of the Argentine dry Chaco, because I wanted to emphasize that, uh, especially in human modified landscapes, biodiversity conservation should contemplate the interests, the needs, and the motivations uh, of the people that are sharing the land with wildlife. So in this presentation, in this talk, you will hear about the process that we began, uh, a transdisciplinary process through which we want to incorporate biodiversity conservation in the agendas of Argentine dry chuck of farmers. And this transdisciplinary team is composed by this farmer association, CREA, which is a national organization in Argentina, farmers that we are engaging, researchers from many institutions of Argentina that work on different aspects of biodiversity, also a governmental agricultural agency that is called INTA and an NGO, the Nature Conservancy. So this presentation is going to be a little different from my more academic presentations that I'm used to uh, because uh, I'm not going to share any results today. But uh, I will give you a little context first, uh, especially to, to, to tell you why we are focusing on the Argentine dry chaco. Then I will talk about the steps we are carrying out to incorporate biodiversity in the farmers' agendas. And finally, I will end with some challenges and key messages that we are finding uh, as, we, as we go through this process. Um, but I will not share any results so far because this is in, in a very early stage yet. So a little about the Chaco and why we focus our project here. The Chaco harbors the largest subtropical dry forest of the world. So it has huge bio, uh, ecological and cultural value. But as you can see in this figure, uh, it is also a global deforestation hotspot. Deforestation rates are, are very high in the region and they are mostly for the expansion of agriculture and cattle ranching in the region. So mostly in the form of farms, medium, small and large farms. And this is aggravated by the fact that less than 7% of the area is protected. But also this high level of deforestation uh, has given place to the establishment of a national forest law in 2007, which uh, demands that, that provinces uh, do land use zoning in their provinces to say where deforestation can or can't take place. So that's why we focus on the Chaco, because we believe that any conservation or biodiversity initiatives that can be held within these farms can have a huge impact for this region that is very threatened nowadays. And now a little about the general process we have developed with the Farmer Association, CREA, the Agricultural State Organization, and this NGO, the Nature Conservancy. We thought first that what we wanted to do first was trying to identify 
points of improvement regarding biodiversity at the farm level. And we wanted those points of improvement to be about two important aspects for biodiversity, which are uh, conservation areas within farms, such as forest patches, corridors, trips, and also the management practices that the farmers take and how they can impact on biodiversity. And once these improvement points are identified, we want to uh, design protocols for implementing those improvement points. And also we want to establish indicators to address whether these improvements actually work or not in situ. So first of all, what we wanted to do was uh, to ask, are farmers interested in this? Do they want to engage in this kind of initiatives? So uh, uh, CREA uh, ran some surveys where they asked a pretty large number of people, around a thousand people, how willing they were to apply strategies regarding biodiversity in their farms. And as you can see here in green, around 80% of the farmers said they were willing to do it. But then when they asked if they were already doing something about biodiversity, most of the people, nine, almost 90% of the people said they were not doing anything about biodiversity in their farms at this point. So then we wanted to know which limitations for engaging in conservation initiatives they identified. And this was a survey to a smaller number of farmers. But interestingly, what they said uh, was uh, that the lack of know-how was the main, oh, sorry, was the main limitation, followed by the lack of incentives to do this, which are some messages that I will discuss later. So as we consider, there is a lot of room to, to do these improvements, but there are also some challenges. So we had a pandemic, as we all know, which also limited what we were able to do, but we held uh, some, some virtual activities during that time, sort of to try to engage farmers in this process. So we had talks about the importance of biodiversity and many other things. But finally, in April of this year, we were able to hold a participatory in-person workshop with uh, innate pilot farms of the Chaco to focus on the first aspect that was identifying these improvement points. And in this participatory workshop, what we did was that researchers, farmers, and practitioners worked all together at the different, uh, at, the, at these eight farms, and they tried to identify these improvement, these points of improvement. And we did this at the farm scale, because as you can see uh, in the Chaco, the farms and the landscapes around the farms can be very different. So generalizations are very difficult. So now we are focusing at the farm scale. And this was a very interesting and enriching process. People were really engaged, the very interesting things and knowledge changes came out. And it also served to sort of, to sort of consolidate this network, this transdisciplinary network with whom we are now working on the next steps that are implementing those improvements in situ in these eight farms. So that's a, a very brief uh, uh, summary of the process. And now I will move to the key messages. Uh, as I said in the beginning of these presentations, for effective solutions, it is key to incorporate the interests, the opinions, and the needs of the people that share the land with biodiversity. And in that sense, uh, there are a lot of great and very robust recommendations coming from research articles, for example. But as we know, those papers sometimes never reach other stakeholders, and even if they reach other stakeholders, sometimes those recommendations are just not feasible from their perspective. And this is, of course, because reaching common ground is difficult. There are a lot of interests. There is not a, an, an only solution. So it takes time. But we believe that small steps are very important. For example, even when we worked in this first participatory workshop only with eight farms, we see a sort of contagion effect where other farmers uh, uh, get to know about this and get interested in this and contact us uh, about this. But still, there are urgent aspects to tackle. And I think these are the, the lack of incentives to do this and also the lack of know-how. Uh, at least in Argentina, uh, biodiversity conservation in private lands, it's still largely about personal motivations and that just can't be the case. We need top-down initiatives, for example, governmental initiatives that promote uh, and regulate and legislate biodiversity conservation in private lands. So we need a combination of top-down and bottom-up bottom approaches so that uh, biodiversity conservation in farms becomes a more regulated and uh, effective process. And with that, I will end. And thanks a lot. And I'm also looking forward to any questions or 
comments in the in the discussion. Thank you so much, Sophia. The participatory component of this presentation and this work that you're doing is is fascinating because I think that you have a unique opportunity, especially working with producers who are a very um, outspoken and strong stakeholder in a lot of conservation efforts. And if you can show that you have um, a minimal group of those that are interested in that poll is incredible and in showing that there's great interest. And so there's room to have that bottom up approach that might inspire some of those top down initiatives that you would be able to work on together with the with the government to provide more policy incentives. Um, but thank you so much for that brief overview and fascinating work. And I hope that someday we all get to visit the Chaco region. Yeah. So <laughs> if you lead us. So our next speaker is Dr. Evan Morton from the US. Evan, go ahead and please feel free to introduce yourself briefly before you start your presentation. Thank you. Okay, can can you see my shared screen? Yes, perfect, you're good to go. Great, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Evan Morton. I am in, based in the United States um, and, my, uh, and I'm a part of the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship where I'm placed in the U United States Department of Energy. And um, I'll be talking about an idea that I've been thinking about for a little bit um, having a climate justice core, which would uh, help to facilitate a global exchange of knowledge and resources to equitably overcome uh, climate change. And with this presentation, I'm kind of just going through how I got to where I am and how I, how this idea has kind of come uh, to fruition through all of the different ideas I've experienced through my uh, journey as an engineer. Um, so this picture is me in, in undergrad. I'm, a, I'm an engineer. I focused on uh, materials engineering in my undergrad and then uh, went into civil and environmental engineering in graduate school. But uh, my experience as an undergraduate student, uh, many times the only person of color and also um, other times uh, one of very few women in a class. Um, this, this kind of shaped my experience as an engineer and our, of course, our classes and experiences were very focused on technology and how technology can solve problems. So that uh, kind of was what framed my experiences as an engineer and what I could do um, in, in that profession. And throughout my undergraduate experience, I really started getting interested in climate change. Um, in the news, they were always talking about that uh, global warming, the earth is warming, it's not good, but I wasn't hearing a lot about the solutions to this problem, and I really wanted to start studying that. So um, throughout, uh, towards the end of my undergraduate career, I had the opportunity to go to Ethiopia and help with a solar, uh, solar panel project, installing solar panels for a, a health clinic. And this experience was really eye-opening because we're working in um, in a different co country outside of the United States, um, working with different cultural knowledge as well as just different life experiences. And it was a really interesting experience because I, we were very focused on technology, but you have to understand when you uh, are, are trying to implement a new idea into a different, um, a different community, you have to deal with people, you have to talk with people and understand the needs of the people there. And I don't feel like we always did the best, the, uh, we did very well in that area because we were so focused on just putting in the technology that, oh, if we just install this solar panel, it will make everything better. Um, so this was a really helpful uh, opportunity to really start seeing the importance of working with people and understanding how a technology can affect the community. Um, after I graduated uh, from, my, from my undergraduate degree, 
I did an internship at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado. And this was my first experience of understanding uh, sustainability or hearing this wor word sustainability. And many of you have probably heard this and um, seen this uh, figure on the right of people, planet, and profit, or other times it says uh, society, environment, and economy. But sustainability is the merging of these three areas and how do we create um, a balance between these three things. And so this was my first experience um, really learning about this subject and further understanding the importance of people in the context of technology. And I also, this was also where I learned more about policy, uh, working at a national lab and understanding the uh, interconnections between technology and policy and how a lot of the great technologies that were being developed in this lab would not uh, ever be deployed in the United States because of policy. And so I really started to move into the policy space, wanting to be able to affect change and see how, how we could get these technologies deployed um, to help with climate change and, and what policies were needed to do that. Um, so after that internship, I started my PhD program at Arizona State University, and I took an ethics class and this was my first time uh, taking a class like that, where again, I learned um, that technology is not always, uh, uh, cannot solve all of our problems. It can be helpful, but we also have to uh, really understand the needs of people. And again, that was very eye-opening. And I used that experience uh, in some of my research um, a friend of mine, Dr. Shakira Hobbs, we are both doing our PhDs at the same time. We had the opportunity to do a project in Belize um, working on anaerobic digestion, um, the process of uh, converting food waste into a uh, biogas for cooking. And in this process, we really started understanding the importance of community engagement. Uh, this, the picture on the left shows us uh, with the village council that we were working with in Belize. And we had several meetings with them uh, explaining uh, the technology, but also getting feedback from them on if they thought the technology could be helpful for them or not. And uh, we also talked with other people in, uh, in the community and had interviews as well as focus groups to really understand the needs of the community and their thoughts on climate change and sustainability and how we might be able to help. And this experience is, was, uh, was how I really saw the, uh, the positive effects of community engagement and also learned a lot of the mistakes that I was making in the past of, of previous projects in other countries and how that could be improved. So all of that has culminated into um, a nonprofit organization that my friend and I created called BioGals which empowers women of color in uh, the science and engineering fields to, um, to do sustainable development projects and to help women of color succeed in these fields. Um, again, we, we really focus on community engagement. We feel that our experiences as women of color can, can relate to other uh, countries of people of color and other co marginalized communities. And we use that experience to help um, uh, integrate technologies that could be helpful for those communities. Um, also throughout my uh, graduate experience, I did, uh, I focused on carbon dioxide removal for my PhD research. Uh, um, if you're not familiar with that uh, field, it's the process of uh, technologies that can remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to help uh, reduce global warming. And this is a picture of me uh, explaining uh, a particular carbon dioxide removal technology called direct air capture. Um, and a lot of the same issues that come up with other renewable energy technologies or technologies that are used to uh, solve climate change um, come up with carbon dioxide removal, especially when wanting to put this technology in a, in a community and understanding the effects uh, 
po both positive and negative that could happen. Um, and through uh, my research, I uh, spoke with a lot of different uh, scientists and engineers focused on this area. And we wanted to make sure, how do we make sure that in the broader context of climate change, how are we making sure that the countries that have not contributed as much to climate change are able to flourish, but also um, pairing that with this difficult situation and how we're trying to reduce our emissions? Um, how do we find a balance in that? How could carbon dioxide removal be helpful in providing economic opportunities for, for uh, countries that have, uh, have not been able to benefit as much as others through in the world? So through, throughout this experience as well, um, this idea of the climate core Climate Justice Corps came about. And um, these are just a few of kind of still in the brainstorming phase of this project, but through the uh, IAI STEP program, I'm having the opportunity to, um, to think more about this issue. Um, how do we make sure that we are accepting indigenous and cultural knowledge that just because the way that you do science in one in one country isn't the same way that science is done in another country doesn't mean that it's uh, better or worse. So how do we make sure that there's an acceptance of these different types of knowledge? Um, how do we make sure that uh, the global north is, ha is um, taking responsibility for the uh, amount of emissions it has produced in the past, uh, but also allowing the global south an opportunity to flourish um, and but also reducing climate change as a whole around the world. How do we find that balance? And um, also making sure that stakeholder engagement and community engagement leads to solutions. It's not just something that stops at those conversations, but that we're actually using the knowledge that we've gained to create uh, solutions. And finally, um, create. I think that the Climate Justice Court could ultimately create a space for knowledge knowledge exchange, collaborative innovation, and shared resources uh, that could help uh, all countries um, uh, participate in the solutions of climate change. Um, so these are just some ideas that I have. It's a very, still very much an idea, but I think uh, just in all of the experiences I have, as well as being in academia, and a lot of our work stops in publications and doesn't necessarily lead to solutions. How can we create something that um, that merges technology, policy, and community engagement to really affect change in our world? So thank you very much. Thank you, Evan. I really appreciate you telling your story. Um, it really highlights this this um, evolution of the influence that um, you know the adventures that you've had throughout your career up to up to now including the impact of an ethics course and traveling outside of your comfort zone um, to different areas and how that has brought you to this point and so I will just point out that we're so glad that we're able at II and in the STEP program to provide a space for people like Evan to bring these ideas um, that are born from passion and experience and, and a desire to provide a solution, to bring these ideas to a forum where she can now work with a group of other STEP fellows from across the Americas. Um, I think their, their science diplomacy project, correct me if, my wrong, if I'm wrong, is focused on inclusivity in science. And the Climate Justice Corps is one of those topics that will be included in this project that will be developed over the next few months as part of our program. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what that group puts together because this is a very important topic, as you're saying, um, that, and it's also a process where it's, it's needed, but it can be very enriching for everyone involved. So I think the journey is, needs to be um, acknowledged and enjoyed um, because there's a lot to learn um, through this participatory and, and engagement process that we've been discussing. So thank you, Evan, very much. Our next speaker 
is Dr. Laris Faroni Perez from Brazil. Laris, I will hand it over to you and let you introduce yourself to our wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Yep. Technology is working so far. <laughs> That's nice. Cool. Let's see if my my internet will work. Looks okay, good. good. Good afternoon, good morning, or good night, depending on where are you. I am Larissa, I am based in Brazil, and I am II STEP and BPB's fellow, and I am also a GOX founder. So I completed my PhD almost four years ago, and when I was te teaching in a Brazilian public university, I decided to change a bit of my scientific focus for working on site society policy interface. And here I am to dialogue on these new horizon sessions about policy to society using an ocean literacy approach with waste picker associations to improve ocean sustainability, restoration, biodiversity, and ecosystem services. So in Brazil, as you know, the country, we have a national solid waste policy that regulates households, industrial manufacturing and commercial wastes, characterizing the source as responsible for the proper waste management and disposal. It also encourages states and local entities to develop plans for the correct waste disposal fostering recycling and logistic reverses. But unfortunately, it isn't working in a real life and solid waste becomes poorly managed, amplifying the global crisis. So over the last 20, sorry, over the last 70 years, the economic growth model and an increased dependency on in single use packing and disposable items have led to a torrent of plastic production. For example, global cumulative production of plastics is forecast to grow from nine to 34 billion tons by 2050. On the other hand, plastic recycling is less than 10%. On an estimative here in Brazil, is that only 3% are actually recycled. So also another estimative is that a garbage truck's worth of plastic is dumped in the ocean every single minute. So that cannot be considered as social norms. The unmanaged waste becomes plastic pollution everywhere. As plastics don't biodegrade, they enter the ocean and break down into smaller and smaller pieces, which are found in the digestive system of many aquatic organisms that we eat. Here in Brazil, plastic pollution was found in 80% of coastal fishes, all commercial fishes that we eat. So that means that without urgent action, plastic pollution threatens nature, human health, and the economy. For example, plastic pollution in our oceans reduces valuable marine ecosystem services up to 2,500 billion each year. And that's not including another social and economical loss like tourism and shipping. So to reverse the, the cycle of decline in the ocean and health, in the ocean health and environmental crisis, and also to support the United Nations of Decade of Ocean Science and Sustainable Development and also the Ecosystem Restoration, I implemented a project called Cultura Oceanica e Catação. That means ocean literacy and pickup or uh, solid waste segregating. 
So for this project that has a transdisciplinary approach with assertive communication and urgent sense, it involves and connect different stakeholders such as waste pickers, cooperatives, society, and decision makers. We planned the steps following the theory of change, and our target is to increase stakeholder engagement into recycling and in sustainable consumption. That means behavior change, looking for uh, clean oceans. So, Ocean literacy, um, ocean literacy is presenting all the steps we planned. We are promoting people a connection to nature, demonstrating nature contribution for us and the ocean values for our existence, health, incomes, and culture. So for our lives. Um, so we are training. Not sure if my internet is working. Uh, we are training uh, pickers from three cooperatives in three cities around the uh, biggest urban mangrove forest here in Brazil. We are promoting capacity building to empower them. Sorry. We are promoting capacity building to empower them to go aboard the working place to interact and meet mid season kids, politicians, and to talk about the proper waste disposal, to talk about recycling, and to talk about avoid ocean pollution. So, for example, to celebrate the World Ocean Day, we promote an event. Integrating pickers with the general society, kids, and local government. We offer several activities like observing marine animals that people never had the opportunity to observe before. Uh, pickers had the opportunity to talk uh, to society and to kids about the segregating material and the recycling. So we had also arts and entertainment activities to sensibilize people to transform their behavior positively. I mean to be more naturally friendly. So the next steps of this project is to keep going with the uh, ocean literacy training with pickers and to develop in a co-creation design with them an educational campaign to raise awareness and to increase citizen engagement in recycling. Also, we will have a public audience at the Chamber of Deputies to keep the dialogue and evoke urgent decisions to improve recycling and design policies to ban single-use packing and disposable eatings. While, and here is the most inter important part, while encouraging citizens to change their behavior. So that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larissi. That's so much work. And I really appreciate you sharing the entire process behind this ocean literacy program. Um, I, I love how you've also included um, the, the economic losses, the tourism impacts that these the, the plastics um, pollution has on, on not just ecosystem services and trying to translate the the effects of this to the diverse stakeholders that you are working um, very hard to engage throughout this process and in these events to to include those policymakers, but also the community youth I saw was a very important um, component and and it's a wonderful segue to our final speaker today as you talked about the importance of behavior change. This is key. Um, for a lot of the, the challenges that we face, I think behavior is at the crux of it, um, including how we make public policy and private policy, right? There, there we need to have um, a change in behavior there so that we can integrate this participatory process and science and evidence into the public policy making space. So 
there's a lot of behavior change that needs to happen on multiple levels. And I'm very happy to end our panel today with Dr. Bhuvanesh Awashti, um, who will share his insights in this in incredible field of, of cognitive behavior. So Bhuvanesh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Larisi. I share my screen, let me. Bhuvanesh, while you share your screen, I'll just I'll just share that here in Panama, uh, we just passed or are the law to ban single use plastics uh, just will go into effect on July 1st. So so we're very excited to see we we banned the uh, shopping bags uh, and, and the polyethylene bags like two years ago and now the single use plastics will go into effect so. This is this is a, an interesting topic that spans borders, um, and I'm glad that that's also a topic that um, that we will be covering in our science diplomacy groups as well at the step program. How's it going, Bhuvanesh? I'm ready. Okay. Okay. There. Yes, we can see your screen. All right. So, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the panelists and all the <clears throat> audience. My name is Bhuvanesh Avasthi. I am a IAI Science Technology Fellow as well as a MITAX Fellow. I work currently with the Financial Consumer Agency, an agency of the Government of Canada. I will be talking about behavioral insights for sustainable climate solutions. When we are talking about this issue, essentially we are looking at what kind of science policy solutions are we interested in creating? When we want to address climate change, as my colleague mentioned, we require behavioral change. Now this behavioral change is both at the individual level, which is mostly what we call the consumer action, as well as organizational level. Both need to come together for a sustainable behavioral change. Now within this context, it's important to recognize that good intentions and good policy may not always result in reliable and sustainable outcomes or actions. So there is something called an action intention gap or intention action gap. So sustainable solutions, despite the wide range of technological and scientific uh, approaches we apply, may not always have the desired action. Why is that the case? Because at the center of all of this are human beings. We know from cognitive and behavioral sciences that human beings do not always behave rationally or do not make rational decisions. There's now quite a bit of research on this topic within the field of cognitive science and psychology, neuroscience and behavioral economics, where we know that human beings prefer short-term gains over long-term benefits. Human decision-making is affected by emotions and behavioral biases. Human beings also have tremendous limitations regarding time projection. So we have limited time horizons. Within this context, it's important to recognize that whenever we are developing a policy, we need to understand behavior. Within this, behavioral science can offer insights. For instance, behavioral science can assess whether those solutions that we are trying to apply, are they aligned behaviorally? Are they actionable for individual as well as collective action. So it's not just one level, but two levels of behavioral analysis that's required. When I talked about behavioral biases, let's look at some of the examples. When we talk about in this context, climate change, it is generally a distant threat or it has been a distant threat for over several decades. From, from an individual point of view, people can think about what they can really do and whether their actions will have any real impact on others, given that others or organizations or institutions aren't really serious. So if people have a perception issue regarding their own capacity to bring about change versus a larger context. So there is something called a social norm. So people generally follow other human beings or organizational 
uh, nudges. Human beings also have what is called present bias. We generally have a preference for things that are available around us in terms of information, in terms of actionable insights, etc. So when we want to talk about behavioral change, we need to be aware of a variety of cognitive and behavioral biases. Here I'm showing you a small list of just like 50 or more behavioral uh, and cognitive biases that are known that affect our decision making. For instance, optimism bias that things will not be that bad and we can still overcome a variety of challenges. Loss aversion bias that I'll touch upon in a minute or so. Things like endowment bias and sunken cost policy where we have invested so much in, let us say, fossil fuel resources and we don't want to change because we have put in so much resources here or we have been doing things this way only like the status quo bias. So when we talk about climate action, we also need to think clearly on the lines of how is it going to cost individually as well as organizationally. So the individual cost, for instance, can be influenced by what is called loss aversion bias, which means human beings generally do not prefer to lose what they have as opposed to gain an equi equivalent amount in terms of benefits or profits. There are also collective long and short term costs related to organizational change when we assess climate action. In this uh, direction, there has been some uh, very important uh, success, sustainable investing. Now this sustainable investing involves integrating the financial markets along certain metrics. They're called the ESG metrics, the environmental, social and governance factors these are all encompassing term. This is an all encompassing term and it involves all phases of the investment process. I'm touching upon behavioral finance because that's the area that will require a lot of attention when we want to develop sustainable, sustainable policy. Recently, the Global Sustainable Investment Review published that report showed that there was a growth of about 35 trillion US dollar investment into ESG metrics or investments that are sustainable. This is a very good step and highly encouraging that we have seen a growth of about 15% in last two years. And it is equating to 36% of all professionally managed assets across the global north. And here in the diagram, uh, you will see that a large section of it is in uh, North American region. So despite this process, there is seemingly a disconnect between sustainable investing as well as classical investing or financial models. So why is this disconnect there? And what is this disconnect? So this disconnect is based on the idea that classical financial models are focused on risk and financial returns. And they look at specific types of factors like capital asset pricing model or based on portfolio allocation model. Whereas ESG considerations are seeking a non-monetary impact. So this is a clear disconnect. People are influenced by personal values when they're investing in ESG and societal pressures, for instance. I talked about social norm. People like to follow the crowd. People like to follow what their neighbors are doing or what others they consider similar are doing. So what do we do about this disconnect when we want to do sustainable investing? Behavioral finance, I propose, is a solution that can address this disconnect in sustainable investing. For instance, we can have a new sustainability agenda, which is based on behavioral finance or behaviorally aligned solutions in the investment space. We need to look at what drives investors to invest sustainably. There is some research that shows that the desire for self-expression, the influence of external context, and an opportunistic motive plays a role. For instance, when I showed you the graphic of 15% increase in the last two years, this is quite encouraging. And so there is definitely a first mover advantage for a lot of individual and institutional investment firms. When I talk about behavioral finance, we also need to be careful regarding the behavioral angle, right? So human preferences for smaller immediate gains over long-term delayed benefits, this is very much in built in how human beings make decisions. We also need to manage expectations in the ESG context because some of them may not be immediately profitable. So we need to look at what we call 
long term benefits again that goes uh, again in the con in, that goes against the grain of humans preferring immediate benefits as opposed to long term benefit uh, long term uh, investment uh, society in the context of relationship management too so we also need to have behaviorally aligned communications how we tell people about esg also plays a critical role in finding a solution behavioral change for sustainability uses several behavioral models they exist to explain and predict mitigation as well as adaptation behaviors both at the individual and collective level now despite these behavioral models there is they have limited usability or limited utility in establishing meaningful change why some of them are being too reductive individualistic linear or they are not really having an environmental impact so again we need to go back and focus on ecosystem change generally high impact behaviors and high emitting groups need to be targeted it's important to recognize the need to address multiple drivers barriers and contexts of behavior what will work in north american or northern regions may not always work in the southern parts of the world so we need to apply just in time interventions which are targeted to moments of change when habits are weaker we need to take into account some of these factors when we develop a policy along these lines so as final key messages we need to have a behaviorally aligned policy coming from a variety of behavioral sciences that will develop um, that will cause individual and organizational behavior change these policy obviously policy solutions need to take into account limitations and biases in human thinking emotions and decision making if we want to have minimal intention action gap so we may have great intentions but some of them may not or many of them may not uh, turn into reliable sustainable action within the context of finance sustainable investing for instance the esg metrics are a step in the right direction and they can benefit a lot from inputs from behavioral finance and behavioral sciences thank you very much for this for your attention thank you bhuvanesh i i hope i'm not alone in saying that um a lot of these terms are it's the first time i'm hearing them and i'm um i'm sort of encouraged to know that there is a whole school of research behind this intention action gap <laughs> um that that we we complain about and that we we wait try and wade through as, as researchers and policy makers you know we have the answer scientifically or technologically yet it's not being implemented and we just throw our hands up and and now to know that there's an entire science that's looking into the why um is is really reassuring and that just emphasizes the importance of having these transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary teams so that we can have people like you uh joining these initiatives to help guide us through these these irrational behaviors and and these this world of biases um so thank you very much that was very enlightening as i knew it would be um and before we the next portion of our panel is is and by and large a discussion but i wanted to give the the attendees a chance to ask any particular questions they may have at this point for our individual panelists. Any questions for Bhuvanesh, Ladisi, Sophia, Evan? Thank you for turning your screens on. I see a hand. Go ahead, Alexander. Thank you, Kim. Uh, I'm just curious about this uh, incredible presentation from uh, Bhuvanesh. Uh, I'd like to know the role of MyTex and IAI in all this uh, in all this work of yours. Uh, it's really interesting, and there's a, uh, uh, also along with the all the transdisciplinarity and environmental thing that we're talking here about. There's this int very interesting social and behavioral aspect of human beings. This is really interesting. <laughs> I would apply that to our uh, national government. <laughs> so, 
So MITAX is a one-year fellowship from the Canadian um, institution, MITAX. It's a science policy fellowship for one year, which is similar to the US Science Technology Fellowship. Uh, and I'm placed with the Financial Consumer Agency here looking at how I can apply uh, my expertise in behavioral science for policy making. So currently I'm looking at uh, training Canadians and improving their uh, financial literacy using these kinds of behavioral nudges. Uh, IIA Fellowship obviously also offers me this opportunity. I am working with uh, a variety of my expert colleagues from uh, North and South American region on developing various types of environmental solutions where I am interested in bringing in the cognitive and behavioral aspect. Because as I mentioned, and as being increasingly uh, recognized that human beings and their limitations on planning, on time perception and, and intention action gap are very critical to any science policy discourse. Bhuvanesh, you may want to also uh, speak a little bit about the science diplomacy project that you have, uh, you know, suggested and other members of the STEP fellows have joined. And this is a cross-cutting cr across the Americas effort to discuss having this in mind. So maybe Alexandria uh, would be happy to uh, hear about that effort as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm also part of the science diplomacy uh, project uh, with the IAI STEP Fellowship, where currently I'm working on a project on addressing the microplastic issue within uh, the American context. So I think one of my colleagues uh, from for the project that is, is also here. And we are, we are interested in addressing this issue from a variety of factors, variety of directions, not just science policy, but also science diplomacy and bringing in different perspectives on the table from various disciplines together to address a common problem. And that requires both science policy and a diplomatic um, effort to address a global issue like this. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your question, Alexandra. Uh, Dr. Goswami, you have a question? Please go ahead. You're on mute. We can't hear you. <laughs> Hi, Bhuvanesh. Uh, this is Dr. Kuntal from Australia. Uh, I really like your area of uh, work. Uh, basically, your area of work is coming in the area of sustainable finance and all that. So, and I'm being an accountant also, and I'm also working in this sustainable finance and uh, sustainable accounting and all that. So, the issue is that one is really your telling them the behavioral finance and all that but the problem is that uh, you all of many of you know that there are lots of sustainability frameworks happened okay all these days like gri we have then international international integrated reporting then sasb from america and all that the problem is happening is that all these days people are telling sustainability and all that and they're telling in academically and in the corporate world is happening that it is not countable and countable it's not been able to integrate within the business so that's why we've not been able to implement now what is happening is that lots of good intention frameworks and things are coming up but then the problem is happening because i'm from accounting point of view the problem in the whole accounting is all about when it comes to implementation of sustainability in the business the materiality principle okay and this materiality principle is happening is that in such a way to integrate with the business is that they're trying to define sustainability from the financial point of view okay as a result people are thinking that it is really going to help because it will be countable and all that. But the problem is, is, is that in the corporate world, they will see that if it is not financially material for my company, it is not a sustainable issue. Okay, so they will measure a sustainability issue, whether they're going to uh, impact uh, or their business future going to impact by the uh, financially uh, that is so if it is not financially material then they will not consider but many of the financial environmental and sustainability issues are beyond financial of a one corporate so how do you think that we can overcome this uh, because things are happening 
good intention, but there is something suboptimal thing is happening. I'm glad you raised this because this is something I'm also <clears throat> interested in learning more about. But definitely, yes, this I, is what I touched upon I, is the disconnect. I, I today, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, today I uh, presented, sorry, I forgot, also on the blended reporting today evening only. And it is very <laughs> fortunate that you also taking that. I thought of telling that, yeah. Yes. So despite the growth, and as you correctly pointed out, that uh, when people think about sustain sustainability, they think differently from what ESG metrics might want to suggest. As I touched upon in my presentation that there is a disconnect because ESG considerations are driven by non-monetary uh, values Science. like, like social Science. pressures or, or need for some, I mean, I would say that within the solution orientation, we can consider that in the direction of corporate sustain, uh, responsibility for social well-being because more and more companies are now being asked to be accountable to how they're influencing the society and individuals rather than just the bottom line, which is uh, very much the classical financial model. So definitely there is a need for a shift and I believe the shift is happening and is going to happen. But the question is that they are defining the sustainability if you go through all those frameworks from the yeah. capital market point of view where they're telling that sustainability is sustainable uh, a sustainability is a sustainability issue if a company is it is financially material for that company now it is suboptimal that is the problem I'm, we are finding that it yeah. is going but actually it is taking us back Yes, I agree with you. There is definitely a disconnect there. And that's why I believe that behavioral finance could be one way to address that, where we look at not just short-term benefits, but long-term um, societal and, and um, based on social norms, we can use a variety of behavioral uh, tools here to bring about a change. Thank you that, that, uh, for your question and comment. And I'm, I'm glad that there's there's been this discussion in other sessions as well. I'm curious actually to see how this would apply, for example, to Sophia's uh, project and, and working with producers. You know, that uh, survey that you did at the beginning, Sophia, to show how interested some of many of the producers were in integrating um, conservation measures for biodiversity onto their lands. That's not driven by a financial decision, you know. Though that's driven by other uh, needs, and and that I'm sure that would be interesting to to investigate as well. That the drivers behind those decisions that they're making to participate in your project and to implement biodiversity conservation measures on their land. Yes, completely. I also think that even when there's not a, a financial driver, there's also like the increasing perception among farmers that these issues are will become important with time. So they are sort of trying to are, are thinking more about them as well. So there are also some things related to perceptions and, and that kind of thing, I think. More long term thinking. That's great. Alexander, please go ahead. Thanks, Kim. Uh, now for Larissa, it's a simple question. How hard was it to engage with the policymakers and uh, municipalities or, you know, the, uh, uh, because I know that in Brazil it's hard to, to get the attention from uh, uh, policymakers and uh, uh, like mayorships or, you know, what to say about the government, the state and federal governments. Um, surprisingly, I think harder was to engage the pickers. <laughs> yeah, because uh, several researchers have been there, so they feel like they were used because researchers have been there from universities and they talk, obtain data and won prize and never have been there to actually to um, being thankful or uh, talk about the results of the research. Um, and, and that is, uh, I am engaging the local uh, politicians and the uh, municipality first in the, in the first step because um, 
they are really interested to be a partner. So talking about uh, municipality contracts, the highest one, I mean, in the economic values is not about uh, education or public health. So the highest value goes through landfills, go through the trash. So uh, they are very open mind to talk, to engage people in recycling. And state level, I, I am not talking yet to them. We will talk on September. And for that, the public minister will be with us as well. And so in the federal level, uh, I know a, a deputy, a federal one, and he is really open mind. And he is the president of environmental um, chamber. And yeah, we have uh, open dialogue, including yesterday I was talking to him. So local government is, is pretty okay. And they are really open mind to, to talk about the project and the recycling. If I could just add there and let you see, I know you have a unique situation because your fellowship is actually affiliated with the House of Representatives. So that's also part of the strategic decision making behind uh, these fellowship programs that we've adapted to each country, right? And so this is a really unique model that we're using in Brazil where Laris and, and some others are housed or affiliated with um, the legislative branch. And that proximity allows you to build relationships and build trust with decision makers so that you can eventually bring these issues um, to the table then and help in other areas that they may have. So um, thank you very much for these interactions. I'm actually, I think that we're going in the right direction. So I'm gonna share my screen so that you can see some of the, um, the discussion questions that we had shared and, and I will share in the chat now. We would like to work on these together on this Jamboard. Um, and I think that this will be enriching as we talk about from multiple perspectives that we have present here. Um, for example, the stakeholders and the, the new and unusual partners. So if we're going to go jump over to this Jamboard and just continue our discussion around these questions um, in the next, in the final minutes that remain of our session today. So let's see if I can toggle. Can everyone still see my screen? Yes, yes we can. Great. So I will posit this question to the group, to the panelists and also the audience as you think about your own work or in light of the presentations that we've heard this morning, who do we think are the most important allies, stakeholders, as well as the new and unusual partners in your work. And how this works is there's this little button over here where you create a sticky note and you can create a note here, ocean trash Can pickers. We still see your PowerPoint. Oh, okay, that's, We don't see so the much. jam board on the... Um... I didn't think it was gonna, okay, let's do, thank you so much for telling me. Um, how's that? Yes, do you see the jam board yes, now? Yes, that's it, yep. Thank you, all right, good. So I'll start with an example here. You create a sticky note through this left-hand side and we'll say trash pickers, is it an association, Nettie's, for example? And we add that to the board and so everyone can add or you can say out loud and I will populate the board as you think of the stakeholders that we need to have in order to have more of more action in this science policy interface. Any other ideas? I'm happy to put plop them in there. If you want to unmute your microphone and just say it out loud, I can also 
just add as we go. Yeah, I think I, I began to answer these when I was talking to Alexandre. <laughs> uh, <laughs> most important, Alice, uh, might be the municipality and also the, the pickers, because when they understand that the project is a symbiotic relationship, so they, they get into the, the project. Yeah, and can I ask you, who at the municipality are you talking to? Um, the uh, secretariats and um, the highest one, I forgot how to say that in English. Prefect, Prefeito? Uh -huh. Works My in Spanish? There, Alexandra, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the mayor? Yeah, the mayor. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, thank you. So the and the secretariats. Level. Yeah, and the secret secretariats. Uh, I have direct uh, talking to the uh, environment one and the services, which is the responsible for the um, households waste. Great, and that's more of a technical level. Yeah. Evan, in your work, what kind of um, new and unusual partners have you have you identified um, in your participatory efforts to to integrate technology and new technology for for sustainability? Um, I think. So I guess some of the work that I've done with my nonprofit in Belize, we've worked with, uh, um, we first started with the village council because they're the ones that make the most decisions and they are voted on by the community. Um, so we worked with them. However, I, it was important for us to also do focus groups throughout the community and, and also interviews uh, just because, you know, even though you voted, not everybody voted for them. So we want to make sure we have a good representation of everybody's thoughts. So we talked, uh, uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that we talked with women because uh, at least in the uh, community we're working in, it was mostly men making decisions. So we want to make sure that we got the thoughts of women and also of, of younger people as well. So just trying to get a good mix of uh, multi-generational and um, thoughts as well. That's wonderful. Thank you for including that. It's very important. As you say, our democracy is not perfect. <laughs> we need to be very strategic in including that and inclusivity. So here, see here, society, consumers. Yeah, allies. I did that um, mm -hmm. mostly because uh, when I, what, what we see a lot in this process of engaging farmers in conservation initiatives that this, this lack of, of incentives becomes a big problem because it's it's just, there, there, there should be incentives and, and, and one of them could be that things like certifications and that kind of things that are usually promoted or demanded by society or by consumers. So there is like this, this gap there between the farmer wanting to do conservation initiatives just because he or she wants to do them or just because there's also some kind of benefit for them or some sort of certification or value in doing that. Mm -hmm. So I think it there can also be some unexpected allies there. Yeah, I like this concept of allies. So, um, the Conservation Council of South Australia, would you like to share, um, whoever put that one, how that has been yeah. an important stakeholder for you? Yes, definitely. Uh, just, uh, I personally run a small research foundation uh, CSDRI, the background you can see. So I, I'm an executive member of Sustainable Research uh, 
executive member of South Australian uh, Conservation Council and also a member of Carbon Neutral Adelaide. So they are the, some of the groups who are doing in South Australia, in Adelaide, uh, promoting the information awareness on conservation and then making an association. The Carbon Neutral Adelaide is an initiative of uh, Adelaide Council. So where they are inviting people who are doing green innovation, green technology startups to come under one umbrella and share some information and all that. And just uh, last week only, we made some kind of sm small seminar where we discussing how we can see this sustainability is an aspiration. Now that aspiration has to be materialized. How to materialize this? That needs green innovation, green startups, uh, ecosystem. And to do that ecosystem also, we need tax benefit and, and different uh, incentive from the government and all that. So, and we had a discussion on that, how we can make, create an ecosystem of green innovations and green startups and all that, so that we can, the aspiration can be materialized. That's wonderful. It's really important to have those uh, councils, associations and forums for everyone to come together to, to brainstorm and, and to, put together resources and, and contacts and, and really identify and, and prioritize the next steps. And conservation, and conservation of South Australia is a, uh, is a premier environmental agency in South Australia and Australia. They have chapters in here and they definitely create lots of awareness as a result. Uh, that awareness helps to tide the swing the election also sometimes uh, that's a great initiative because until unless you create a electorate who are believing in environment or conservation you cannot have a policy okay so for that because we are in a democracy so in the democracy the elected members do the policy but elected member only will do the policy when the electorate will ask for that policy oh, yeah. so if the electorate asks for coal they will do policy for the coal but if the electorate asks for conservation and environment then they will be doing that so they do enormous job in awareness the local people and the state uh, electorates so that they understand the value of environment conservation and then they demand to their respective politicians and the councillors and all that so that you make the policy so once there is a demand for that then the policy will come up so that's a great contribution they do that's wonderful a multiplying effect excellent i imagine Crea has a similar effect on the producers as well sophia so i'm going to um Thank you, everyone. I'm going to jump to the next one um, because I think this is this brings us back to a little a little deeper into um, the skills that we need to be able to do all of that outreach and work that we've been discussing. So what kind of skills do emerging leaders need to stay ahead of the curve and adapt to the rapid change around us? And so, Bhuvanesh, one of the questions I had was, what were you thinking this entire time during the pandemic as far as behavior change um, and, and what you were observing from, from your perspective? Um, because I think this rapid change around us, I would like us to focus on that. Um, one of the, the topics that we discuss at, at IAI is, in this transdisciplinary approach, we have to have constant dialogue and flexibility to be able to adapt to the very diverse needs of, I mean, we're working with the Americas and Latin America and the Caribbean are often lumped into one group, but that's incredibly diverse in and of itself. And you start to break it down. So um, the diversity and then the need to address these rapid changes in front of us, um, you know, especially when we're talking about technological advances. Um, and it brings me back also to, to what Evan mentioned about the importance of ethics um, as, we, as we discuss these. So what kind of skills do you need panelists or audience in order to stay ahead of the curve and adapt and be effective in the science policy interface?
I'll add, I'll add the one that always comes up, communication. <laughs> and we could divide communication into many different areas. I would say behaviorally aligned communication. So there you go. <laughs> within communication, a subset. What, what does that mean, Bhuvanesh? <laughs> that mean uh, solutions and approaches that people are going to find easy, effective, social, and timely. So certain kinds of behavioral frameworks uh, can be applied whenever we uh, tell people what to do or what not to do. So they need to be things that people will uh, find it uh, find easy to do and they should be timely for instance and they should have some kind of a social element to them because human beings are social creatures so we respond to social norms faster and much more as opposed to things that require individual action mm -hmm. very good Imagination, I like that one. We do need creativity, very much so. Having different access to different stakeholders. So uh, that's also something that I heard a lot in the sessions this week. And we hear often from our step fellows is moving outside of your comfort zone. Um, and if you move outside of your comfort zone, then you find that you have access to these different stakeholders. So perhaps the skill is <laughs> having that courage to move outside of your comfort zone. I know, um, Sophia, you and I have talked about this process that um, when you went out and spoke to the producers in this portion of your project, that was, that was something different than what your postdoc research had been. You know, for the first time you were leading workshops with, with actual producers and that required an, a completely different method of communication and approach. Yeah, totally. I yeah, I, I would have liked to have more more tools before I, I acquired them through the program and also like through going just going through the process. But yes, also trying to 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 translate messages from academia or from research to other stakeholders is very challenging. And I was also thinking regarding skills that uh, of course there are many skills but there are also a limited number of, of skills we can have. So also like trusting or, or, or putting more energy in, collect, in generated in collective knowledge and it change. I think it's also a valuable thing to do because there's some sort of collective knowledge that emerges when there are a lot of disciplines and actors that, that can be very valuable because one cannot have all the skills necessary to carry out these projects. Very true. Very true. I've, I've learned that very much in the, in the science policy interface, particularly there are those that are really good at synthesizing the, the publications and then a completely set of skills to facilitate the uptake of that information. So making those contacts with the decision makers and working, you know, it's more people skills versus going through and, and pulling out those points from the publications. I like this one, um, break out of the the dome to get out of the bubble because everything is connected and to be assertive who who put that one if you'd like to share about being a, the power of being assertive <laughs> that's me larissa great <laughs> that's what i do <laughs> <laughs> and where does that assertiveness come from <laughs> Yeah, because I, I think we, we need a holistic vision, approach, and action. So sometimes uh, in the university, they, they tell us to be specialized in something, but actually, I like to be generalized. Like, we need to be really holistic. Mm -hmm. That's very true. 
yeah, just, just being holistic, we can have a participatory and inclusive governance. And it's, it's a completely new way of thinking. I think we, we also talked about that transdisciplinarity as a way of life um, and doing that constant assessment as well. Are we talking to all of the, is everyone at the table and who's not at the table looking at those gaps um, and making sure that we're being inclusive, but time is an important factor. So I would say a skill also is managing your time. Um, and, and in our projects, a, a lot of time because of external uh, pressures like funding, for example, we don't have the time to do um, that important outreach um, and stakeholder engagement to all of these stakeholders. So it's good to, to have that mapped out as we did in the previous um, slide, but then now hone in on these skills to, be real, to really capitalize on these important stakeholders that we've mentioned. Oh, I like this one, adaptability. So you have to be able to adapt to your audience and different stakeholders. So if you have that one pitch deck, you know it's not gonna be the same um, for the technical uh, or the community members or the national secretary, for example. So you have to be able to, to adapt. And, and I think an important part of that adaptation I would add is the skill of listening um, and asking questions and being empathetic. Yeah. So uh, thank you. Put that, put that, find that a comment. Yeah. Okay, no, just put that on the board, what you just said. <laughs> Listening. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. All right. It's on the board. Thank you. So, friends, we are at the top of the hour. And unfortunately, we have to bring this conversation to an end. But it has been such a joy to share, especially with my panelists. And I, I thank each and every one of you for signing on and making this an enriching conversation um, and for being part of this conference with us. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Kim. Thank you to thank all. Thank you, Kim, and thanks everyone. Bye. See you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Congratulations. You. Wonderful session. Thanks, Marcella. Thank you.